These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There is a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos dot htm or you can just use the link in the info box. By the way, I also offer tutoring via Skype and you can find more information about that Skype tutoring service at my website. Thanks. Okay, well why don't we start uh, taking a look at a bunch of examples and seeing how to, uh, to work through those. So why don't you try, uh, see if you can draw the mechanism for this reaction. That's excellent, except the, that you didn't draw the mechanism. Okay, oh yes. Okay. Um. Okay, there we go. Good. So, in uh, organic chemistry, when we say draw the mechanism, what we mean is electron pushing arrows. The mechanism is the electron pushing arrows. And it turns out that those are really one of the real keys to mastering the course. Whenever possible, you want to draw the mechanism for every reaction as you're going through. The mechanisms explain the reactions. So um, that's something we want to go through. Okay, so one thing that you did here, uh, we always want to identify the charges. A lot of people would naively look at this and say there are no charges, but I think we talked about last time, this is really an ionic bond. Anytime you have um, something from the right side and the left side of the periodic table, it's really an ionic bond, which means that we should put in these charges. Anytime you see things ionically bonded, you should put in the charges. Um, and the way you're going to see this generally here is sodium and potassium with um, non-metals. So here are the sodium and potassium. So we draw in the charges. And then you put in your electron pushing arrows. Well, um, to start with here, we should ask ourselves, um, so what, what type of mechanism did you draw here? I drew uh, uh, SN2. That's right. But how did you know it would be SN2? Um, because fairly good leading group, and, uh, and we have a good nucleophile, so, and there was only a second degree carbon, so it seemed favorable. Okay, those reasonable. all things seem reasonable, and so those are all uh, good considerations. Let's also try using the table in the handout and see if that would give us the right answer here. So, let's see where we would be. Let's see if I have a copy of that for myself. Okay. So this would be the SN2, E2, SN1, E1 handout, and we're looking at the table at the bottom of page 3 on how to determine SN2, E2, SN1, and E2, E1, the table at the bottom of page 3. Uh, let's make sure you have the most up-to-date handouts. Ah, you do. Very good. Okay. So first of all, we have to find the right row, which is based on the alpha carbon. By the way, do, do you know what I mean by alpha carbon? Can you yeah. point to the alpha carbon in the substance? It's, uh, it's the carbon connected to the ion. Yeah, that's very useful terminology. The carbon with the leaving group is the alpha carbon. It's a good habit to get into to start labeling the alpha carbon. So I'm going to label the alpha carbon here. All right, now looking at that alpha carbon, is it primary, secondary, or tertiary? It's secondary. Secondary. So we should be in the row labeled secondary. All right, so we find the secondary row. And now we have to ask, well, what's our nucleophile going to be? Uh, our nucleophile is going to be um, bromide. Yeah. New, uh, and we also have to ch ask what, what's the nucleophilic atom and what's its charge? Well, the atom is the bromine and the charge is negative because okay. that can make a difference. So let's find the column with bromide in it. All right, and which cell would we be in then? This one. That's right. And it looks like your guess was uh, correct or your prediction was correct. Uh, this is going to be an SN2 reaction. Okay, uh, so uh, that's a good way to analyze this. Uh, bromide is a good enough nucleophile to do an SN2 reaction. All right, but it's not a good enough base to do an E2. 
Okay, so um, your prediction was correct. This is SN2. So as we go along, maybe we'll try to get more and more practice with using this table for the harder cases. Since you mentioned one of the things uh, that maybe was giving you a little difficulty was predicting whether it would be yes. SN2 or SN1 or E1 or E2. And you can see the table is pretty complicated, so it takes some practice. All right, and then you put in your electron pushing arrow. Now, every time we draw an electron pushing arrow, we have to ask, why is this arrow reasonable? Uh, so let's ask, uh, why is it reasonable? And every arrow, remember, has a head and a tail. Here's the tail, and here's the head. So why is it reasonable for this bromide to be at the tail of the arrow? Well, we usually want to explain things in terms of charges. This is reasonable to put at the tail because it has a negative charge. And why is it reasonable for this carbon to be at the head? Um, well, it doesn't seem like it has a charge, but it has a delta positive. So we want to put things with positives or delta positives at the head, and we want to put things with negatives or delta negatives at the tail. One of the real keys to the course is focusing on the charges. The charges are way more important than most students realize. So we have to justify things based on that. Okay, so that's a reasonable arrow. <coughs> However, um, this already has a full octet, so it can't gain electrons unless the eye bag leaves at the same time. How many steps are there in an SN2 reaction? There's a one. That's right, so we have to show these two things happening concertedly. Okay, um, and then you also noticed, is this a stereocenter, or is this going to be a stereocenter? Yes. Yes, and therefore, um, you have to take care of the stereochemistry, and it looks like you're familiar with the idea that SN2 inverts the stereochemistry. Uh, and what's a good way to invert? Well, you can just make a single swap, if you're familiar with the single swap rule. Um, so if I simply put the bromine here, I would have the same configuration as before. So the way to get the inverted configuration is to make a single swap. So I'll swap the bromine with a hidden hydrogen. And if you swap the bromine with a hidden hydrogen, you get the picture that you drew. Uh, and then we have the iodide, the negative charge, and we can draw a new ionic bond between these two. All right, so it seems like you're all pretty comfortable, already pretty comfortable with that, so we can go into some more complicated stuff. All right, thanks. Drawing the mechanism here. Okay, so we can go through this together. Or H 
that, I guess. Now, one of the principles that we want to be seeing here is um, in organic chemistry, what's the right way to figure out what's going to happen? Um, now, you mentioned looking to see whether it looks right. That's a natural instinct. However, that actually messes people up. Instead of asking whether it looks right, we should ask, does this follow the general principles that we've learned? Of course, first of all, we have to learn the general principles. But we learn the general principles, and then we follow those principles, regardless of whether what we get kind of looks similar to what we've seen before. So what we'll see as we go along. So it's natural to kind of just see, ask, does this look similar? Uh, but instead, we want to follow the general principles here.